balance lies today or in the future? So I'd say to answer your question, I don't, I'm not sure I, I know. I haven't seen any good evidence. Home care has been trying to prove their efficacy for a long time. Um, it's challenging to do because it's not an experiment. So how can you prove? You can only, the opportunity here when they haven't done a lot of work on ED visits. Um, and so they probably will do it slowly. And so there's opportunity here to see if they can make an impact on that kind of an outcome. Because you can compare it to those who are essentially doing nothing or just doing regular care. Uh, and there's an opportunity there early to be able to evaluate if there's any need for investment. Uh, and, and for which groups. Right? But once you implement home care the way it's implemented, you can kind of look at relative efficiency across jurisdictions. But um, evaluating whether or not they are there their cost effective over other models is challenging. So I, I mean, I would, that's a good question for the room. Certainly, obviously I don't have an answer. I had a thought about that. Uh, and that is preferences for elderly patients. I think, uh, it, again, it depends, but I don't think a lot of times, um, a huge proportion of that cognitive impairment, their preferences will be change drastically. For people that are close to dying, the preference changes are, uh, when they look at those studies in the palliative patients, uh, they are, uh, for advanced directives, for example, they have huge preference changes uh, right at the end of death. So that's why it's very hard to pin down preference as a uh, unit. a totally different um, side of this debate. So when you had mentioned that in the United States there's sort of this idea of financial incentives to make um, emergency departments senior friendly, would it, would it be advantageous in Canada to look at sort of the accreditation process for hospitals and including that as an aspect? Or even having a separate sort of accreditation and saying this is a senior friendly hospital as sort of a way to make it prestigious or to sort of promote it in that way of saying like, this is really beneficial, you can promote this within your community instead of looking at financial, we always look sort of at financial incentives. Okay. So it's a good suggestion. So establishing you know, accreditation for senior friendliness you know, in an emergency yeah. department. I think the problem though, I guess, would be you have to decide what makes it senior friendly. We could do that. do that, assuming we could do that. Yeah. What would be, Challenges. So I'll, I'll give. I can give a cynical perspective. Oh I'm sure. Very but um, so that perspective would be that hospitals would just say they're doing it and can impress an inspector of some sort mm -hmm. and not actually fulfill any of the any of the uh, sort of uh, suggestions in the guidelines that you know in, in a real way. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, we have some comfortable mattresses. Oh, we've got some nurses on staff, but nothing's really connected, right? Mm -hmm. That could be the outcome. Because people tend to work towards tests, and, and it could be empty at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So I mean, my perspective would be that it's ultimately probably hopeless until there's greater understanding of what the needs are and the results. Because without that, that base level education as to why you're changing things, um, I think that some of those uh, Policy sort of directives might be empty at the end of the day and could be counterproductive. I wonder. Any other thoughts on that? That's a good question. I'm just thinking we have pediatric specific hospitals, right? Would it make sense to do something like that? Not necessarily, not to try and make EDs more senior friendly, but say that the niche for EDs is this. And we have another area where we can treat seniors um, with. So I don't I don't know if that's it's not home care, it's not long term care, but and assuming our resources are infinite, um, I think that that might be a way to go about it as opposed to trying to incorporate a population that has sp like special needs because we do it with pediatrics. It just kind of doesn't make sense to me why we can't do it with geriatrics once it gets to that level. So you sort of see it 
current. So in Toronto, for instance, you have Toronto General across the street from Mount Sinai. And in Toronto General, they're very outpatient oriented, surgically oriented. And it's actually Mount Sinai's job because they have the capacity, the interest to do it as well. Things with Wall, well, actually they take care of the sort of general medicine seniors. Um, and so you're starting to see it. And of course they have some of the bigger minds around geriatrics there. Um, so you do see it where there's sort of enough variation. But if you think about small community hospitals, um, they by default would have to be a, a center of excellence in elderly care, which might be unachievable because all of them have, you know, if you, could, if you did a head count on every hospital bed, you'd probably see over 60% on average would have, you know, would be older adults in the bed. So um, I'd say it, depend on, it might depend on the context, but it's probably an area we'd probably have to go because you don't have enough resources to spread too much. I actually kind of have a similar question, but not so much about um, hospitals, but about uh, specialists or geriatricians. When we make comparisons across countries, for instance, are we really comparing the same with the same? Because I, we could imagine, for instance, very well that in, in Canada we have fewer geriatricians, but we have more geriatric surgeons, for instance, or we have more uh, uh, cancer uh, doctors who also specialize in cancer in, among older patients, is that is that a case? And maybe the, my broad question is, what is it exactly that a, a geriatrician is, is doing? When we say we, we need more geriatrician, I, I don't really understand what they are doing. Are they doing the kind of assessment that you, you showed? And but why would a GP not be able to do that? Or are they surgeons specializing in, in older patients, but then they are, well, I think I would say they are mostly surgeons who happen to specialize in, in older patients. I don't really see what a geriatrician could be as a specialty. I apologize if there are geriatricians in the room. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a good conversation that we're having because, well, there are two things. There are one, they provide the clinical services for older adults, and many of them act as consultants. <coughs> so on complicated cases, and there's so many of them, there's, just, there's enough. They come in to say, for example, wait a minute, you really don't want to put catheter in every older adult that comes in the door because you're going to give them all infections. And you think they have this diagnosis, but did you notice, right? So they're essentially, they build puzzles clinically, which others aren't trained to do. And they simply don't have the training. And it's perpetual because their second role is also in education, where they're responsible for fulfilling the rotations in medicine programs that train physicians. And when there's so few of them, you don't have those rotations. And so you graduate oncologists and surgeons with absolutely no concept of that perspective of medicine. Uh, Michelle, at the, the hospital I was at, they asked the same question that Chair was like, I don't know what geriatrics does. And they got a large group of geriatricians there. And they, I think through time, we've seen what they do. So it's uh, uh, geriatric oncology, for, it's now taking a, a, a breakdown of each one of these things. Geriatric oncology has now come to Canada, and it's uh, specializing in looking at function and the impact that that has on cancer treatment. So I think of geriatric assessment mostly as functional assessment. So we think of all these broad categories of diseases, of, um, uh, of like usually whatever the disease category is. But there's a particular aspect of functional reserve. And whether a person can have a rehab stay or not. Right? And so in geriatric oncology, they'll say, look, he is, uh, in his functional status, he will not do well with any chemotherapy. So before, they weren't able to assess function very well and do the, the full range of what functional assessment is. And so that shows that they can target those individuals that will benefit most from the therapy in, in cancer, for example, okay? But that it also exists in other more chronic diseases. Uh, so, and a lot of times what we do is we say, this person is not gonna go to rehab. They're not gonna make any functional recovery and you kind of assess that. So it's looking at function for that thing. What's happened now, and so now people understand what that is at the hospital linebacker, for example, but it took them a while. And uh, now they're combining geriatrics in the space with palliative care. So like UCF staff is saying, what's the prognosis that someone's actually gonna do well after uh, they're here? And so it's, it's, doing, it's linking that piece to 
two important things to add is that there's evidence, RCTs, static reviews. In fact, the uh, gentleman Graham Ellis, he's going to give a health forum talk next week. He did that static review that shows that the way they deliver care, which is multidisciplinary by definition, um, which is very important, it's effective. It reduces all the bad things that our health system is trying desperately to do with other measures. But so what you're saying is that we need geriatricians who specialize in oncology, for instance, more than we need oncologists who specialize in geriatrics. It would be nice if we had both. Mm -hmm. But the geriatricians... Well, it can be both. I mean, at, uh, when, yeah. they, when they are in medical school, they have to, to choose one. So would you say study geriatrics and then specialize in oncology? Or would you say, well, you're an oncologist, that's fine, you specialize it, or you, you study cancer, and then, for some reason, you're going to specialize in older patients. That, that's, I guess, that, that would be my question. The discussion that I've heard with, with colleagues is that, essentially, the response has to be everybody. The challenge is the catch-22 that those who are responsible for teaching the geriatrics are the specialists, and there's just so few. So, if you want to have, you know, on, you know, internal medicine specialists, physicians that are interested in no geriatrics, it takes a specialist geriatrician to teach them that in medical school. There's just so few of them. So ideally you'd have everybody with that's more in tune. We just have one more question because the time is yeah, going sorry. to creep over from Mike back there. It's partially covered. My question is going to be that, um, so if we have 200 uh, geriatricians or geriatric physicians, specialists, whatever they're called, so where's the slack thing picked up from? Clearly, some of it's not being picked up given the comparisons across countries, but is it general internists? Uh, those types of people are picking it up. And, and, and I guess related to that, then, what are the types of training proposals that are out there to actually bump the capacity of the system up in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years? Do you know? So, um, who's picking up the slack? Arguably, nobody. Because if you, if you don't see it, right, you're not. If you don't have the perspective where you're looking for these complex things, you don't understand them. Right, but it's not like the system isn't bottom, fully bottom, right? There's clearly an issue. So, so when it's well, thinking, like, so is it the general interns or like, it seems like some of those folks are the ones that are definitely, yeah, yeah. essentially, it's everybody. Um, you'd say we're bottom. You could, the perspective is that we, maybe we are bottoming out. We have such high rates of older adults uh, being warehoused in locations that they weren't designed for them, right? and you don't see that everywhere you look. The, uh, there hasn't been, to my knowledge, a proposal to increase the training capacity. Um, that's just something where I'll leave it. I mean, there's the awareness of the issue, but um, so little awareness probably that um, there hasn't been a great proposal, to my knowledge. There's no plan at the, you know, at the College of Medicine that I'm aware of. But there's growing awareness that Look at where we where we ended up. A lot of it's financial. Um, geriatricians have been poorly paid compared to other specialists, compared to others. And so when you come out of medical school with three hundred thousand dollars of debt, you don't go into geriatrics to make money. Um, they've improved that, and so we're seeing improvements. But most of the of the residency positions, even in this institution, go unfilled every single year, and they're happy. I think we got maybe three to make master last year. And that was like cause for celebration. <laughs> Hallelujah! Yeah, that was that was a surprise. So is it maybe incorporating? I'm sorry, no more public debt. So is it maybe incorporating minimum standards for each for many different specialties as opposed to just one? So everyone gets some basic level of training in their actually. Yep. But the resource plan ha hasn't been worked out. <clears throat> Who's going to do it? Yeah. yeah, that's that's the challenge. Thanks, Rachel. So, thanks, Andrew, for coming in today. And, uh,